the three most energy hungry countries in the world are China, India, and the United States. And between them, those countries account for something like two thirds of the world's reserves of coal. And for different reasons, with different motivations, those countries are going to use their coal. The United States is going to use its coal for energy security because it doesn't want to be dependent on third parties for the energy supply that it needs to maintain its standard of living. India and China are going to be use their coal because they're both enormously rapidly developing economies. They know that improving standard of living depends on increasing the energy supply. And why should they think of paying high international prices for gas and oil when they have coal on their doorstep, which allows them to generate electricity cheaply? The downside is that coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel that we have. Reserves of coal globally are something like four times those of oil and gas. So although we talk of oil and gas becoming scarcer and more expensive, you don't say the same thing about coal. So that coal is going to be used. And the really big challenge for anyone interested in climate change and really trying to preserve our way of life on Earth is actually finding a way of burning the coal, burning coal cleanly. And I know that this is going to be an issue in New Zealand because gas supplies, indigenous gas, is no longer as abundant as it used to be. And there is indigenous coal here. But the fact is that we are going to have to find out how to burn coal cleanly. Now, don't get the impression that I'm advocating the burning of coal. I am not. I am, simply going to, I am simply saying that whether we like it or not, coal is going to be burned. And it is very much in our interest to do what we can um, to ensure that that coal is burned cleanly. And that will involve our making massive investments in the R&D necessary to accomplish that. If we simply burn up all our fossil fuels, of which there are something, there's something like between four and 5,000 gigatons if we just burnt up everything. Uh, I mean, it's there, we can do it. I'm sure civilization is capable of such things. But if that were to happen, the model temperature is of a rise of around about eight degrees. So that takes us well back into the greenhouse world. And with CO2 levels five or six times pre-industrial. And the modeling also shows that um, uh, they would rise and come back down, but not back to what they were, but at some significantly higher level, two or three times. So that would actually maintain the Earth at a persistently warmer temperature. And there's no question, but under those conditions, the, uh, the Greenland ice sheet would go, the West Antarctic ice sheet would go. And between them, that's 12 metres of sea level rise. But very likely, the... Um, most of the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is the, the larger part of Antarctica, would go, and that has 60 metres of sea level equivalent. Global mean temperature is increasing. That doesn't mean much for most people, but it, it's something which we expect does respond to forcings of the climate system. And in some sense, it's like the canary in the cold mine. It indicates to scientists that something is going on. However, um, sea temperatures are rising everywhere, uh, land temperatures are rising, and uh, since about 1970, the land temperatures are going up at about double the rate of uh, sea surface temperatures. Sea surface temperatures in turn in the tropics relate to uh, hurricanes and more intense hurricanes and longer lasting hurricanes are a part of the picture. One of the things that happens with increased heating is that some of the heat goes into evaporation, drying, that is apt to create uh, longer and uh, more intense droughts, and we see that occurring around the world, especially through much of the tropics and in the subtropics, Africa and Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, uh, the Sahel region, Northern Africa, Southern Europe, 
Uh, southern parts of Asia, even the Amazon region, have been experiencing droughts in uh, recent times. Also, because of the increased drying, putting more moisture into the atmosphere, the moisture has to go somewhere. We see an increase in water vapor occurring. We believe that's up about 4% since 1970, and that means that all of the storms that occur uh, reach out and grab that available moisture and then dump it down in the, in the form of more intense rainfalls. And the observations clearly show that that's happening around the world, even in places where rainfall as a whole or precipitation as a whole is decreasing, the heavy events are increasing. And so we see uh, events, uh, this includes things like snowfall, which may be not at all intuitive and related to uh, warming, uh, an increase in snowfall because there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. All of us have a responsibility to, to try and do something at the, at the wider level, at the, the local council, neighborhood level, if you like, and at the national level, the, the, the government policy level. And there's a huge amount that individuals can do. So um, I'm not just talking about talking to the mayor or talking to your councillor. I'm talking about writing to your MP. I'm talking about writing to a minister. Uh, to try and get them to take a, a more considered and progressive attitude on uh, climate change. I think those are things that all of us can do. The most important thing that the man in the street and the woman in the street and the child in the street can do and the school in the street can do is write to their politicians and make their politicians aware that this is a matter that really concerns them. Been, I have been, I worked with politicians when I was a civil servant and now as a, in, in Parliament, I'm surrounded by them. Politicians respond to nothing so nearly as readily as they do to their post bag. That if you ask me, really, well, the most important thing they can do, it is that. It is make their politicians believe that that is important.